close to one right here. Mm. Hi everyone, welcome to the BPF meeting at ITF 118. Uh, thanks for everyone who's here and online as well. Uh, we're gonna have a nice um, short meeting today and we made like great progress in the last meeting. So thanks to everyone for working on the list as well as the Linux kernel list as well. And my co-chair David is in, uh, back in the US. He's getting married in four days. Look how happy he is. So, yeah. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so he'll be uh, around if you have any questions as well. So, um, just like uh, feel free to type on the meet echo. And um, so, with no further ado, we'll get started. So, this is the note 12. You kept seeing this. It's just like what are the rights you give to the ITF. Uh, and like the, there's too much detail to put on the slide. Just follow the links and, and uh, look at the details in there. And Murray, you're excused. Have a good meeting. <laughs> and, and, and please uh, um, follow the idea of code of conduct. And please be respectful and provide courtesy to your colleagues all the times. And um, just it's, it's fine to talk about the technology, but not about the people. So like, you know, please be mindful of that. And don't worry about the blue sheets, like just to the on-site tool if you want to talk or not, because it helps us like plan the room better. So get, this is the only way we get a count of how many people come into a room. So we don't get into a too small or too big room and we don't have to guess. So please join the tool. And uh, looking at the deliverables itself, like we have like one milestone deliverable right now, and that is the instruction set and that's due in March next year. And we made like great progress. So thank you, Dave, for like pushing that along. And um, we come like a long way since the working group has been formed, and it's like very short time. And uh, our goal is to kind of like uh, talk about all the changes that have happened since the last meeting, which have been a lot, and talk about like, you know, any, anything that's open, which I think there's at least one thing that's open and that they will talk about. And, and hopefully we'll be able to get to working group last call sometime in the near future, like hopefully before the next meeting or at, at least at the next meeting cycle. And then Alexi is gonna talk about the uh, BPF memory model uh, and um, like uh, we, saw, I, we saw the slides, it looks awesome. So like, you know, we'll just let uh, Alexi talk about it and put the things, um, but it's like, you know, we had to figure out like you know, how to dispatch it further. So um, any questions on the agenda? Is there anything else you would like to bring up? Seeing nothing further, uh, Dave, you're there. I'll run it. Just call it next slide. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Suresh said to thank me, but I'm just the editor. A uh, lot of contributions from other people that, that I will acknowledge later on. Um, I've just been collecting stuff and doing the transform. So instruction set architecture. Uh, you can see this one is now draft IETF. Next slide, please. So let's start out by talking about what happened as a result of the discussion last IETF. Uh, last IETF, there was a couple of points about text that needed to move out of the ISA document and into a separate document that's the ABI document. That has been done. The ABI document exists, but it hasn't yet been submitted as an internet draft. It's, this, it's there and ready to be submitted, I think, um, but uh, it hasn't been submitted yet, but it has been moved there. Uh, we had a long discussion last IETF about the INA considerations of what we do for instructions, and we had uh, three categories that were talked about, permanent, provisional, and historical, and we'd have a label and very similar to how some of the other registries work. Uh, and during the discussion, we agreed that uh, the permanent IANA uh, policies would be standards action or IESG review, right? So that was the outcome of the discussion, and that has now been reflected in the document. Uh, 
Uh, provisional and historical is just what we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, uh, but the permanent was the one we had discussion about, and that's where we settled as the consensus from last meeting, and there was no changes as a result of the confirmation on the list, so that was done. Uh, and then finally, uh, as you mentioned, the ISA document was adopted as a working group document, so now it's revved back to draft 00, zero because it's draft IETF. Next slide. So that was a result of the discussion. Okay, so since I last IETF meeting, there was subsequent discussion on the list, and so a number of things were, were done in the, in the um, document as a result of list discussion. The first one was we had meeting discussion, and then we tried to confirm consensus on the list, and what we found is that the meeting discussion was uh, different from what the list said, and that's because the list raised new points, and I'm going to walk through that. Okay. And so uh, last time we talked about uh, two different ways of expressing the instructions in an IANA registry. We had a single table version and a multiple table version, and I'll show you an example later on. And in the, in the meeting, we said, well, they're kind of equivalent. You can do it either way. It doesn't really matter. And so there was a general preference to do option number two with multiple tables, that that was going to be cleaner. Since then, the list discussion pointed out that they were not, in fact, equivalent. And I'll explain why. And because they're not, in fact, equivalent, um, uh, Alexi and I both argued that this means we need to go for option number one, which is the way that it already was. And so we've left that. And so that's what I'm going to walk through here to explain why they're not equivalent and why we stuck with option number one. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, this is an example in option number one. Okay. And so in option number one, there's a table with multiple key fields, right? So for the following opcode plus source plus IMM plus offset, offset, right? That four tuple has to be unique in the table. And then the, the description is what the meaning of that four tuple is, okay? And so you'll notice here in opcode 17, right? Source is zero and offset is zero, okay? IMM is wildcarded, but it's really opcode op code is specified, source is specified, offset is specified. Compare that to the option two version, next slide. This was the op, uh, an option two version, which said, because there's only one thing using opcode 17, then opcode 17 means that, and opcode zero hex 18 has multiple things that are distinguished by source, and there's a separate table for that. The problem with this one is, you notice, go back a slide, please. This one says only one source equals zero. Go forward one. This one says, all of source is now defined to be this, and so it consumes a lot more of the address space than the option one does. So this one wastes lots of space and consumes potentially a scarce resources, or you know, eventually it may become scarce, right? And so option number one is actually more specific, and therefore they're not equivalent. So we went with the more specific one to not just you know, waste space here all and there all over the place, okay? And so that's why we left it there, because this point was not part of the discussion last time when we thought it was equivalent. And so it's just explaining why we did not make the change we kind of agreed on in, in IETF because of the subsequent list discussion. Confirmation on the list reversed that consensus because of new information. Okay. Other changes. And so this is where a number of people have authored contributions that have been merged into the main RST file from which the internet draft is, is generated. Um, and you can see the um, uh, contributors or the authors of those contributions over there in brackets. Uh, Will, who's the one that gave a presentation uh, at IETF 117, uh, added some uh, informative text explaining a type convention and a glossary definition so that you could understand the text built in the document. Um, Jose defined or corrected there was two errors in the, in the document uh, around the definitions of BPF neg and BPF call. So Jose and Will fixed those. Uh, previously, the document used a mix of BPF and eBPF interchangeably. And so that was made consistent throughout. And then there was a few typos that I fixed in the opcode appendix, where the opcode appendix is you know, informative. It's supposed to match up what was in the body. Um, and so like I had to mirror the corrected definitions and things like that. And then there was a number of new instructions added since last time by uh, Yong Hong. And we'll walk through those in later slides, right? Last time we talked about, we expect there to be new instructions. There needs to be a process for new instructions. And so now we're kind of exercising that, okay? And so there, so look, we'll talk through that in the next couple of slides. Okay, so all these are things that are already in the published document right now. That's the draft IETF BPF ISA 00. Next slide. Okay, 
So here's a quick list of the new instructions, okay? I'm not gonna walk through those. Most of those are kind of self-explanatory. Sign, division, and modulo. Turns out there's actually many definitions of sign modulo. Um, you can read the Wikipedia article or other ones for many different definitions. So this one defines it as being truncated division, which is, by the way, is the normal one for C, right? But different languages have different variations of, of sign modulo. Uh, move and load with sign extension, unconditional byte swap, as opposed to like uh, little endian or big endian. This one says, regardless of the endianness of, of, your, of your processor, do a byte swap. And then jump with a 32-bit offset, where previously the instruction was to jump with a 16-bit offset. So those are different new instructions that have been added into the tables and, and new um, uh, tuples uh, uh, consumed. And there's a number of implementations that are already out there. Um, the LLVM, often known as Clang, compiler added these as CPU v4 instructions. Uh, the GCC compiler has been adding support. Uh, the Linux kernel verifier and JIT compiler have support, and other implementations are also in progress across these instructions right now. So it's already out there. There's already interoperability, and so we're just documenting what's already out there as more and more implementations do it. We want them to do it the same way. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Now to the main topic that I asked to be on the agenda for. So we start, I started a thread on the mailing list, and then I'm going to walk through the details here. And when we say there is one remaining open issue that we know of, this is it, okay? If we get done with this one and everything that falls out of this one, then in theory, we're done, right? Okay, unless somebody finds new, you know, typos or new, you know, errors or whatever it is, but there's only one open issue and this is it, okay? So, um, background, there's a number of things that are producers of this, right? Things that generate instructions, right? So compilers like Clang and GCC and so on, some applications, use generate um, BPF bytecode directly without being compiled from a source language like C or Rust or whatever. They just generate and use the bytecode directly. And there's various test suites to exercise things, right? So those generate instructions. On the <clears throat> conceptual receiving side, the parsing side, a number of things are parsers, right? Verifiers are parsers, JIT compilers, interpreters, uh, <coughs> disassemblers are parsers, <coughs> right? And so there needs to be a way for generators and parsers to have the same way to refer to a set of things that are mandatory, right? And so if a, uh, if a runtime says, well, I have this verifier and this JIT compiler and I support the following instruction set, I gotta be able to tell a compiler to generate instructions that will work with that particular set of things that, that runtime will work, right? So how do we negotiate which instructions those are? So a compiler doesn't start using optimizations. They put in instructions that the parser does not understand, right? So you just have to have a way to label those, right? Whether that's in a documentation that humans read, whether that's in something that can be dynamically queried, doesn't matter. You first have to agree on how do you name things? How do you label things? How do you label what's the unit of conformance? Okay. Um, so this, uh, once you have a way to label them, then you could do, you know, dynamic version or capability negotiation, or you could just have it be in documentation, humans read it, and then they use command line options to say the compiler to say generate CPU version 4. Okay. Okay. But that means you got to have a way to name what does CPU version 4 mean, right? When the next thing comes along, what is the next thing called, and are all, everything going to use, all the compiler is going to use the same label for it and so on. So this is what I was asking. And so what is the, what are those? What's the convention? And how do you map those to instructions? That's the last thing that's not in the document now. So let's walk through this. Next slide. Okay. So second piece of background is that, um, and I'll get to this one at the end. So I want you to think about this and I'm gonna have part of the questions for this one at the end. So that you don't have to ask questions about it now unless it's clarifying because I'm first gonna walk through the proposal and then come back to this at the, as the last point. Okay. So there's lots of different things here that may not be mandatory. There's really two categories that I'll be talking about. One is categories that um, there might be other existing ways to do, and this is just a more efficient way to do it. Okay? So now with a new instruction, you can do it in one, where previously it took three instructions to do the same thing. So now a compiler can say, if it supports the new optimized way, I'll generate the new optimized instruction. If it doesn't, I'll do it the slow way and generate three instructions. Right? So some of these are ones that says, well, the source code is going to be the source code either way, and it's whether they show up or not. Okay, that's the first category. There's a bunch of stuff in there, things like you know unconditional byte swap. I can do that in one instruction. Okay, if it's the, if the instruction is there. Previously, I had to do multiple instructions to do that. Okay, 
Then there's a category that's the one I'm going to talk about at the end, which is support for specific constructs, okay? Things that if you write a program, there's just no other way to do. It's either there or it's not there, okay? So can you call a function that is exported by the runtime, or can you not call it, okay? And we'll talk about that later. All right. So one of my goals, which may or may not be the working group's goal, uh, and I'll ask that as a question later on, is to keep existing deployments compliant, okay? So since our working group charter says we try to document existing practice, that's one of the questions that we'll ask at the end, because I don't know what the consensus is gonna be on this one when I ask the question, so. All right, next slide. All right, some possible units of granularity, right? So I said this is bus, there's shoes, there's maze, whatever it is, whether you call it that, some other way of expressing units of conformance. We've talked about there can be extensions and other documents. There could be, you know, proprietary extensions or at least, you know, platform specific extensions really um, in other documents and places and so on. So how do you, what's the unit of granularity of saying I support the set of stuff? Well, you could all the way go down and say every individual instruction is a should and you can, in, you can pick and choose among instructions. That's not really practical because you have an explosion of things. You can say, well, I support the following, you know, 1,000 things, and somebody else supports a different 1,000 things. It's just not practical to use in, in any real deployment. So that's possible, but I'm certainly not going to argue for that. Um, then there's kind of what's existing practice, uh, which stems originally from Clang, and GCC has kind of adopted the same kind of conventions here. Um, and so there you have things like, is it CPU v1, v2, v3, v4? That concept was created by Clang and has now been copied in GCC, but does it apply to other compilers like as a couple of Rust to BPF instruction compilers that are out there. Are they gonna adopt the same conventions? Should they? That depends on what we say here, okay? Um, and there are some things that don't exactly map to CPU versions, and I'll go into this in more detail on the next slide. And so, for example, when 32-bit uh, arithmetic instructions were added, right? Normally they're 64-bit, but you could add to a 32-bit with, with um, zero extension and so on. When those were added, um, the CPU version wasn't revved, and it was called uh, target feature ALU32. Later on, it was rolled into, into CPU version 3. So initially, there was a set that was the ALU32 set of stuff. Okay. Now, the CPU versions don't correlate to logical units of functionality. Right? Between 2 and 3, they added you know, another arithmetic instruction, and a jump instruction, and a, th th there's just a collection of things that were all put into V3. So this one is kind of existing practice, but it doesn't really correlate to anything other than historical you know, stuff. Dave, um, David has a question online. Uh, yeah, do you want to interrupt or do you want to wait till the end of the slide? Uh, I can wait till the end of the slide. Okay, all right, let me finish up and then, then go ahead. Uh, and then finally, you could do things like, well, let's group all things that are in the same unit of functionality, like all the things that are atomic instructions or all the things that are kind of of the same type. The, Problem is there's nothing in code that means just because you in support one that you have, that, that's not like they go together necessarily, right? A logical unit of functionality isn't something you have to support the whole set or it's meaningless, right? So it's not a strong reason to do that. And the reason against it is, well, it doesn't match historical practice, right? So these are the things that have been discussed on the list here. And I, yeah, as you'll see, I'm gonna be going for a variation of the middle category here. But first we got David and then Christoph online before I go through the proposal. Uh, I can't wait to see what your proposal is. I'll let Christoph go, but uh, I can chime in after your, okay. your next slide. Yeah, I'm actually happy to wait a bit too. I just wanted to place my notice that I'm going to say something about this. I couldn't make out Christoph. Did anybody else? The, the audio is kind audio of pretty, um, Okay, I don't know what's up with the audio. I'll throw it in the chat then. But Christoph said that he's happy to wait for a couple, one or two slides. He just wanted to put okay. his name with you. Thank you. All right, so we'll wait for a couple more, but yeah, feel free to jump back in line. All right, let's go on to the next slide then. Um, all right, so this one is still background. This is just showing, this is taken from the GCC wiki, um, and you'll see it kind of mirrors the Clang compiler options. So uh, the way to read this is uh, CPU equals V2. So first there was a CPU V1, and then jump EXT was added, and then CPU equals V2 includes jump EXT and maybe some other stuff. And then jump 32, ALU 32, and V3 atomics were other you know, categories that were added. And the CPU V3 includes those three things. So if you specify CPU V3, it means all of V2 plus jump 32 plus ALU 32 plus V3 atomics. Okay. 
CPU v4 was just added, which includes all of CPU v3 plus vSwap, sdiv, and smove as separate options, right? So you can say, I want CPU v4, but except for sdiv, right? So you can individually toggle these groups on and off in GCC, right? But the point is, these are labels, and they reuse some of the labels that uh, Clang used, right? The CPU equals v whatever convention. You see ALU32 on there. Right. The point is both of the major compilers are using the same kind of convention here of using strings with CPU equals V to wrap things that are categories of stuff. Okay? So that's the existing uh, uh, stuff that's out there now okay, that we can use to help inform. If we were going to do this in the future, what do we want to do? And I'm going to argue the best example of thing, knowing what we want to do in the future is look at what we've already done and say, if it's been working and nobody's been complaining on it, let's try to say, let's try to set this as a precedent and say, this is the way to do things going forward is to do things we've done in the past, okay? That's where my proposal is gonna come from, is it saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? Uh, I see Christoph is still in the queue, so I think I have a proposal slide. You can just tip ahead if you're checking it yourself, but otherwise you can ask now or wait until after the proposal slide. Yeah, let's see if Christoph can talk now. Christoph, go ahead. Both of them, okay, all right, go ahead, let's go. He's just waiting in the queue, all right. This is the proposal, and I think I have an example on the next slide. So the proposal is to create, meaning an example of what the registry would look like. I'd like to propose that we create a new INR registry, okay? The INR registry would have string labels. String labels would be things like, right, if we were to retroactively use things, that just as an example, right, they would have things like ALU32, CPU equals V3, CPU equals V4 would be the string labels, I enter registry, why? Because they have to be unique and because you don't have to be in the IETF to register instructions, right? That was the uh, permanent provisional and historical provisional did not require IETF action. So anybody can register provisional. So that means somebody can generate a string. So you gotta have a registry to make sure there's no collisions, okay? So we create a string registry. Each label corresponds to some set of instructions that are mandatory, right? So that label is, points to some spec that says what the instructions are that are mandatory for this label, okay? Each instruction that's defined has to have one or maybe more, and I'll give you a more example later on, uh, but typically one label that it's part of, okay? So here's an instruction, and this is part of the ALU32 group, whatever it is. An implementation, okay, whether that implementation is a parser are generated, but typically we think of this as the parser side, right? Like a uh, the Linux kernel or um, the uh, uh, llvm dash obj dump uh, disassembler, things like that, right? It supports a set of labels, okay? Not just one, but a set of labels. It could say at one point in history it was you know CPU equals v2 plus ALU32, right? That was the point in history right before CPU v3 was snapped, right? Um, and so just Think of that as the next version, and this is the, ana this is the analogy for, you know, same thing two years from now, and it's just different labels then. Now, this shows, just like in the uh, nesting slide of the GCC that I showed, that groups can be nested, right? CPU equals V3 includes ALU32, so you got to have a way to express that. And when you define a specification, whether that's in the IETF or from some provisional thing that's outside the IETF, uh, then you would be responsible for defining, if you're doing new instructions, one or more, if necessary, conformance groups for those instructions. So then in the base spec, we would have more than one, and I'll explain why, um, and then any instructions that you would think of, this is kind of like a should or whatever, that means it's in a different conformance group than the ones that are musts. Right? Okay. So if somebody does not support them, then it, is, then it is missing that label in its list of what it supports. And then IANA allocation policies, I'm gonna propose exactly the same as for instructions, right? You're gonna register these at the same time as you're registering instructions. To me, it makes sense to have exactly the same registration policies that I showed on the second slide, okay? This is the proposal that I have anyway. Feel free to, you know, beat it up or suggest alternatives, but let me show you an example. Next slide. Okay, this is the example of what something might look like. Uh, and again, I'm retroactively using old stuff here just so we can kind of see what it would look like if this had existed five years ago, right? So this is not the entire table, right? This is just showing a, a snippet of it to get the point, okay? In this example, there's three conformance groups. Those three conformance groups are labeled uh, legacy, which I made up, um, ALU32 and CPU equals V3. 
and not shown is like a CPU equals V2 label um, also in the table. And you can see all three of these point to the current document, okay, the, 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 which right now is the internet draft. And you can see there's, la there's, row there's columns for includes and excludes, right? I say once CPU V3 came out, then that said it's all of CPU equals V2 plus the other conformance groups that it rolled into plus maybe any instructions that are directly labeled CPU equals V3, right? So this says it includes all of CPU V2. So if there's some instruction that says CPU equals V2, you don't have to relabel it in the instruction table, okay? You just say it's CPU V2, but CPU V3 means all the instructions which have the label CPU equals V3 plus all the instructions that have the label CPU equals V2 and anything it includes, right? This is recursive, right? Plus any instructions that have ALU32. Minus any instructions that have the label legacy. So why legacy? Well, we have the notion of deprecation, right? We've kind of already done this once, okay? We have, you can see in the bottom table here, this is just showing the instruction table. Uh, and all I've done here in this proposal is I've added another column on the right. Everything other than the conformance group column there is what we talked about last ITF. This says add another column. And in this example, there's only one, in, one label in each, uh, in each uh, cell there. There's never any case, there's two, okay? Um, that's because we're starting with one that's already legacy, right? Anything that's deprecated, we stick in the legacy label. Uh, and this is just showing what would happen if three years from now, we wanted to deprecate an existing instruction. We'd already have, say, CPU equals V4 or something in that column. How do we deprecate it? Okay, what you would do is you'd add, besides CPU equals V4, you'd add another label, which is, you know, legacy two or something like that that you make up. Now it has two labels there. And in the conformance groups, it would say, you know, CPU equals V5 means CPU equals V4, excluding legacy two. Okay, that's how you express that. Okay. So this right here is the end of the proposal part. The rest is kind of fallout from what happens if you do this. Okay. So if you have questions from the mic, please come to the mic now on the proposal part, because if we kind of sort of agree with this, then it gets down into the details, and that's the subsequent slides. Okay. Yeah, I do have a question, Dave. So this means like any new instruction needs to have uh, confirmation info, uh, this like conformance group info for sure, right? Uh, it's I, not I, I made up the term conformance group. It's a label that, yeah. yeah. So it needs to have it, right? Like, so yes. is there gonna be a default label that things fall into if somebody doesn't request one? Sorry, you a bit more. Yes, every instruction here must have a conformance group is my proposal. So is there gonna be a default one that we fall into if people don't wanna specify one? Uh, there is no default. Uh, all the rest uh, that falls out from it is on subsequent slides. So, okay. cool. Okay, thanks. Uh, and the um, and meaning in the INA registry, the how you would apply for an addition here, this would be must be present, right? Okay, cool. Meaning it must reference something in the conformance groups registry, okay. is the way I would write the text if we if we think this is a good way to go. Uh, and the mapping between the instruction and the conformance group is like going to be verified using expert review or whatever policy we come up with, right? not just the conformance group, but the mapping as well for the instructions. That needs to go through the review as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got a queue. I can't see who's in the queue next, so. Christoph, you can go first. If you Christoph is okay, the so when I compare this, how the like uh, optional instruction support works in like actual CPU architectures, I see a lot of similarities and one major difference. And if you look at like x86 or RISC-V, which I'm most familiar with, and I think ARM works pretty similar, but I'm not quite as uh, knowledgeable there, is that instead of doing two things in a group, which is reference actual in instructions and reference other groups, they usually split it in two different concepts. So you have like a, a low level group that is basically a set of instructions. And then you have a more higher level thing, which in ARM like is the CPU uh, instruction set version. And in RISC-V it's shorthands uh, that basically are a just a convenience handle for a bunch of groups that is often more marketing name, but also very similar to say passive compilers. And I think that's actually in many ways less confusing, right? So in your examples, we'd still have say the ALU32 group and then the uh, uh, 
other instructions that, that basically anything would need to have a shorthand name for the extension. And then you do something like the CPU v2, v3, v4 as a grouping of the useful baseline that happens at a hopefully very low cadence. Uh, so the audio in this room is not great. There was some distortion there. Uh, I'm gonna tell you what I think that I heard because I'm not sure. If I understood you right, or maybe it's a question, did you say that uh, what you're familiar with was a case where everything had a group that was like a AOU32 and there was a separate layer that was CPU v3. And so in your uh, preference, like in the bottom table, you'd never see CPU equals v2 or CPU equals v3. You'd always see a more specific one that was then wrapped in a CPU v2 or v3. Is that what you were saying? Because I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, yes, that was the biggest part of it. And then I probably give the bigger, say, marketing name or high level grouping a different name than conformance group. But yeah. OK, let's see who else is in the queue. Thank you. And David. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think overall, like the, the conformance group label approach seems reasonable, like it's flexible enough to be able to, to do what we need. Um, I do, I'm not sure how I feel about using, and I'm not sure if you were just using this as an example or not, but CPU equals V2, CPU equals V3. We pointed this out before, but it really is very just like circumstantial and historical how those played out with um, the LVM releases, right? It was like whatever instructions people needed, um, they would add them and then LVM would do a release and they'd have a new CPU version. And there was no other kind of higher level like reason, rhyme or reason for it. So um, I think if we're gonna group uh, instructions by by like type and like a, like logical grouping, that makes sense to me. I know that Alexia said that it, we could also bike shed, but as far as grouping, grouping it by CPU version, I'm not really following exactly what that would buy us beyond just for some reason, matching like LVM, um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, again, audio is a little bit garbled, so I'm kind of trying to read the uh, text uh, transcription of David's comments. Um, I th think where I'm, uh, my response to Christoph, which might be the same thing as you were saying, David, is. If you have a, let's say you went to CPU v5 and all you did is you added one uh, jump instruction, one ALU instruction, and one atomic or something like that, right? It wouldn't make sense to have three conformance groups with a single instruction just to have a CPU v5, right? So that's why um, I like the proposal here as being probably uh, less registrations than having a strict two level one as Christoph was arguing, but I don't feel strongly either way, so. Thanks, Alexi. So uh, to explain the point about uh, bike shading that uh, David sort of referred to, uh, all of this CPU v1, v2, v3, v4, they are legacy effectively. This is how, like, in the first in the first place, the name CPU is there only because in LVM that was an existing flag, and we had like no better idea just to call them v1, v2, v3. And, but all of this like other flag, like ALU CT2, they actually already diverging between GCC and Clang. GCC choose to like add different flags. For, for LVM, some of those flags were actually added later, not necessarily as part of the grouping, but as a way to uh, like test compiler and a verifier and like the whole tool chain. So the grouping that you have like a <clears throat> jumps and LUs and everything, they're not necessarily that meaningful like if we do this uh kind of grouping for for the purpose of the standardization for real we would need to go back and really look at all instructions and then like group them into new new uh, some sort of groups and but most likely this will be only for the standard itself and not for the compiler like in the compiler we already have flags we don't want to like break them all suddenly change the behavior either of gcc or for lvm and they're already like different so doing the exercise of the grouping on one side kind of makes sense and logically the way you explained it and especially like anal the christoph's analogy to risk five makes sense but to me it feels 
little bit like a wasted effort because like compilers are already different. This is stuff in the wild and the future MCPU v5. I will actually <coughs> talk on my slides like two possible new instructions that we might add as part of CPU v5. Uh, they don't, they probably falls into well, not even atomics, they fall into like new instructions. <laughs> uh, I don't even know how to uh, group them. So, though I like what you're proposing here, I see a hard time, like it feels to me that this is like very quickly becomes a bike, sh bike shading exercise. Okay, um, I think the notion that GCC and Clang have different definitions of what ALU32 means is an important point. Uh, and so keep this in mind as to say, this is my analogy to say it, that if we would have done this five years ago, then they would have had the same definition, right? That's the analogy, right? Say, if we were to do this in the future, if we define the string here, then Clang and GCC can then use the same string, or at least they can coordinate at the same time as we're putting into this document rather than arbitrarily doing things. So uh, the proposal here is to reduce cases, ideally eliminate to the extent that people can form to RFCs, right? Cases where they diverge in the future, right? We can't do anything about ba backward stuff, but future stuff, hopefully we can help with. Um, that's my opinion. Um, I want to go to the questions now because I'm expecting, think, um, oh, there's they, one more person. Yeah, Christoph is in the line again. Go ahead, Christoph. Ah. Christoph, right? did you want to say something? Yes, but it helps if I unmute myself first. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I want to get back a little more into what Alexei said, right? I mean, our grouping as of right now should not be based on how instructions were historically developed and supported in compilers. I think what we need to make sure is for all the instructions we have in the ISA document right now, we need to figure out which of those are mandatory and which are optional and what are useful groupings for those that are optional and provide a good extensibility mechanism for the future. And, and I think uh, Dave mentioned earlier, there's something about having existing implementations conform. And I think that's a nice to have, especially for important in the sense of market share implementations but it's not irrational per se. I mean, if we do the right thing and that means no existing uh, implementation is conformant, I think that's okay, at least if we can easily bring them into conformance, but not mandatory. All right, thank you, Christoph. Uh, uh, that's a good segue to the actual questions because this part was to say, do we agree on, the exist uh, on having conformance groups with labels as a way to describe stuff in the future? If the answer is yes, then I can ask the questions using that terminology. And it sounds like I haven't heard anybody arguing against that for future things, only about problems with replying it to maybe backwards things. There's uh, maybe some issues there. So am I okay asking the questions now? Go ahead, Lexi. Uh, just a quick comment about conformance. Uh, they will said like, is Linux kernel is conformant and with what? Is it conformant with MCPU before? It maybe. But then it depends what architecture we're talking about. Like it's supported fully on x86, on ARM64 and S390, as far as I remember, but not on other architectures. But then is kernel overall on all architectures conformant with V3? The answer is similar, no. Is it conformant even with V1? The answer is also no. So like if you look at some like specific architecture, like the uh, user mode Linux, VPF doesn't even exist there. So there is conformance, it's uh, like, is Windows conformant to anything? Yeah, if you have a particular running system, that system will be conformant to some set of labels. Okay? If you say the Linux kernel, that can be running on many different systems, you know, ARM, x86, RISC, etc. They may all have different sets of labels and stuff across them, but for any particular system, the intent is, is a set of labels that apply to that particular system which typically would be a operating system version plus CPU architecture combination, but it may be more than just that, like offload card or whatever. So, all right, I wanna ask my questions now and use this as the, as the phrasing of the question. Um, the meaning when I wrote the text of what conformance groups do we use as the, base, as the spec baseline, right? So we've got a table of a bunch of instructions that would be in the initial INR registry, okay? 
if we agree that there's going to be some labels next to every instruction, we have to figure out what labels go in the table initially. Okay? Do we say every row in the table has one either legacy, which are the deprecated ones, and CPU equals v4, or some other label if you like, some other label better. So there's only two right now. It's everything that's not deprecated and everything that's deprecated. Or is it some other finer granularity? Okay. So if you said, well, I want some in-market ones to be compliant, then that means they won't have CPU v4 if they're in market, because that's the newest thing, and they haven't gotten to be widely deployed yet, um, at least in some cases. And so should you say, well, here's all the ones that are v3, and then here's the ones that were added in v4, so that some things can say they were compliant to v3? Or do we just say, no, we're just going to snap and say v4, and they're just not RFC compliant? This is the number one question. Okay, and there's things that are maybe not, it would be nice, like Christoph said, I think it's the same, it would be nice if you could say, well, I'm conformant to CPU equals V3 label for the uh, in-market devices, and CPU equals 4 is what we recommend going forward, and please do that. I would love to say that. Other people might love to say, let's just make everything V4, and we don't care if they're RFC compliant or not, right? For me, it's nice, and so this is the question number one, and so I think, Christoph, you wanted to weigh in on that one too, so I see you're in the queue, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, as, as Alex has said, I mean, whatever we do, we should not use CPU v3 or v4 as names. Even if we end up fully mapping to that, we should give them meaningful names. Uh, this is number one. The other is, especially from the NVMe background where we have some use for upcoming things, that there we have program types where atomics absolutely don't make sense for the kinds of programs. So I really love to be able to have a baseline that just doesn't have any atomics because I think even in the long run, there's specific program types where atomics just don't make sense and there's, it would be good to disallow them. Otherwise, I'd let people that have more deployed things in there, but I, 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 can, I can definitely go with your recommendation of having an equivalent of CPU V3 as sort of the legacy baseline, as long as it has a better name. I could also see the argument that we want to do the full thing. And I think someone like Alexei, who has more insight how things are deployed and how hard are all the new instructions to bring into an implementation chime in than try to smart is here. OK, so I took two high level points out of that. And so I've been watching the transcription here to make sure I've been following. Um, I think one of your main points is um, you like the concept, but you don't like the name CPU v3. So as long as we change the label to something more meaningful, then uh, you like that idea, including whatever CPU v3 that some subset of stuff is in there. That's your first main point. And I think your second main point that I saw was actually in response to my second question, uh, which is you think that the uh, atomics should be in its own uh, conformance group. And that, I think, was a proposal that's going to be relevant to my second question here. And let me know if I got that wrong, but I think that was your two high-level points, and everything else kind of fought, fell out of those two high-level points. So he's saying yes in chat. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to ask my second question. And I mentioned I was going to come back to this earlier on. I said there are some constructs that are highly visible in source code. It's not like they're part of an optimization. You either can map this to a CBPF or you can't. Okay? And so one example is, can I call some function that's exported by the runtime? Okay. There's some instructions for that. So call helper function by BTF ID, call helper function by address, which is the older one. Um, and so you could say, well, if I have a runtime, let's say it's an offload card, that actually exports no helper functions. It just does you know, a program type, and you can return some values that say you know, drop or pass or whatever it is, but there's no helper functions exposed. If I don't support the instructions to call functions that don't exist, am I still compliant? Okay. I would argue, yes, you should be, because there's no possible use for them on that particular thing, right? And so you could argue the same thing could happen for things like instructions that are in the 64-bit immediates, like get the address of a runtime platform variable. If you have no platform variables, then there's no such thing as an instruction to reference one. Um, if you have some architecture that doesn't have a concept of a map for some reason, I don't know if there is one, but hypothetically, then getting the instruction the first value, the map would have no value. Okay? There are instructions that have these things. So a couple of ways that one could go about these. Um, one is to say you could put those in its own conformance group. Okay? And by the way, atomics are in this too, because atomics are specific 
other things that show up in your source code. And I think in Alexi's slides show some examples of, of this and his slides. You'll see that later on. Um, is to say, OK, as long as you don't write a program that does those, the compiler can still map it, right? So should that be in its own conformance group? OK, that would be kind of what um, Christoph was proposing. Or could you put them in the same conformance group and say it's conditionally mandatory? Well, you must support this instructions if you actually export any runtime functions. Or you must support the, the runtime platform variable. Uh, as long as if you actually have any platform variables, then you must support this instruction. That would be conditionally mandatory because you wouldn't have to have a separate conformance group, but either apply or not apply. Okay? Um, and so that would be another way to do it. And I'm not sure between those two. Uh, I'm open for input there, but we can't be done until we make a decision there. And so I at least heard Christoph arguing for a separate conformance group, but that was before I mentioned this other possibility. So I don't care. I just want to know what to put in the document. So if people have opinions on this, um, we got to come to something to put it into the document before it can be done. All right. Q. Q. Dave? I think it's my yeah. Just, so yeah, I just want to kind of reiterate what I was saying earlier. Like, I, I really don't see why having a V3 would would like it feels like we're just we would just have a v3 conformance because that's how it is right but like uh, having having conformance groups that reflect the actual behavior of the instructions is feels much more um it reflects kind of the intention a lot more right like if you're if you're implementing some support and offload or whatever you you're, you have a reason for it you probably have a specific set of use cases that you're trying to enable and i think having a, just a group of v3 CPU v3 instructions just because that's what LVM supported at the time. I mean, it's um, we, we could. I, I just don't really see like like why that would be useful to anybody. Um, so, yeah, I, I think for me at least, having having separate conformance groups makes makes a lot more sense. Okay, got it. I think I understood that. Yep. Next, Alex. Um, I would like to provide some historical uh, background of how. Uh, CPU v3 came about. So we've started, so Netronom started working on uploading VPF into the NIC, into the smart NIC. And very quickly they realized that 64 bit architecture and 64 bit registers for them don't really work that well because internally they have like 32 bit. So the whole LU32 and in particular CPU v3 was pretty much like created to ease the of loading of VPF instructions set into hardware. But, and like they actually did like amazing job, like we worked together like uh, different companies to achieve this uh, great result. But at the end, out of CPU v3, they decided not to implement few instructions. In particular, this was uh, uh, at that time in v3, we only had on-site division and module operations. And for the hardware, it just like didn't make sense. Like they couldn't really do them in the hardware efficiently. So they support everything but division. And now in the CPU before we have signed uh, modular and division operations. So are they like divisions and modules should be in their own like category and grouping? Maybe, but that's what we can do just because like we know the past and learn from our mistakes and understand the history. But most likely what will happen when let's say BPF gets adopted by NVMe, and VME folks will say that, well, we actually need new instructions on one side to well, make our life easier. And at the same time, we don't like those that already exist. And that would mean that add new grouping and reshuffling all of the grouping that already exists. Just a comment, because you can have more than one group per instruction, it doesn't require reshuffling. Everything else you said makes sense, but I'm just, I can answer that one. It doesn't require reshuffling. Sure. So uh, what I guess um, I would like to propose is uh, instead of having this like V2, V3, V4, and in general like conformance, like we can group different instructions into different categories like atomics, uh, LU operations, like jumps, conditionals, etc., and then whatever vendor they will just say what they actually support. Instead of having like label whether you conform it with whatever V3, V4, or whether you conform it with atomics, it's easier for hardware or implementation runtime to say what they actually support. So what I'm proposing is to remove this like should or must uh, distinctions from the standard and have only the grouping and say like 
this is what is supported. Okay. Um, we still got one more person in the queue. I mean, I can comment on that, but uh, there's another participant, so let's train the queue. What's that? Okay, was that from chat? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, 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 so, Eric uh, asked, what happens when there's a new atomic? Um, it goes into a new specification, okay, meaning, assuming that this was already in RFC, I guess that, that's the context to your question. This is already in RFC, now somebody adds a new atomic. Okay. There has to be a new document that specifies to, to that so that you can register it in the Anna registry. Because there's a new document, there's a new conformance group. It could only have one instruction, and it could have multiple things in it that's in that document. That's what happens. Yeah. It would not be part of the predefined atomics group. That's correct. It would be part of the atomics two group, which in my proposal might include atomics, and there would be an atomics group that would include atomics, or or it would be completely separate if you did not want to have included. That's how you write the spec. So. Um, yeah, and I think this this goes back. Oh, sorry. Was someone talking? About I think Christoph was last in queue. Ah, okay, sorry. And, th and then I'll come back to my comments. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I think we need to clearly distinguish between, again, the two things is what amount of grouping do we want to do for the existing instructions? And I think it's very clear we need at least an absolute minimum amount of grouping by getting rid of the legacy instructions. And I think I've seen some interest, including from Alexei, to have a little more grouping than that, at least. And I'm not sure we need to decide on the exact grouping. I, I definitely prefer to be a not too fine grained because that's going to create problems. But the exact amount we need to find and for any future extensions, I would actually expect them to be fairly fine grained. And I actually hope there's not going to be too many of them anyway. <laughs> Christoph, how do you feel about the proposal to not have like should and must and we group the group the instructions, but don't don't have any kind of compliance enforcement on enabling all of those in the group? Oh, I was actually going to say something on that. Good that you remind. I, for instruction compliance, it should I think is a complete non-starter. Should should compliance for instructions just doesn't work. We need a grouping and you need to be able to rely on everything in that grouping to be fully supported and a must. But I think Alexis' point is that we've seen in practice that that actually isn't true, right? Like you don't have to support every instruction to provide a, a use case for offload or, or whatever. No, no, every instruction in a given group because your programs and your tool chains need to be able to rely on it. So you need to be able to pick the number of groups you want to support, but you need to be able to rely on them being fully supported, which I guess loops back into how do we define these groups to actually be useful to the use cases. Yeah, and then that kind of also loops into the, uh, the, the danger of bike shedding that Alexei was, was referring to as well. But I mean, I think that makes sense. It's just, can can we can we like create groups with a confidence that are sufficiently granular to let um, to let you know to basically not force uh, off people offloading to like implement instructions they don't need or implement them inefficiently, but also not have like this should concept where you don't really have a lot of guarantees from the compliance. And I don't know, and maybe we can. I'm not sure. All right, so I'm going to mention what I hear, what I heard, and then I'll jump in with my own opinion. And I think I agree with uh, the way that Christoph was phrasing things, just as, a, as an intro, if I understood things right. Um, I think what I've heard is that, uh, forget the labels that I was using in the example, right? We take the existing instructions and we create a, a multiple conformance groups that make sense, um, like the legacy ones is one uh, obvious example, but otherwise things that make sense to either uh, not implement, like uh, Lexi gave the example of maybe division. If we know of cases where offload cards do not want division, then that would be a fine example of something to put in a separate conformance group. Um, atomics that, Christian, that uh, Christoph mentioned, Right, would be in a separate conformance group because we can we know of a technical argument for when you might not want to support that. I gave the argument about you know platform variables. If you don't have that, then the plat anything around platform variables can be in a separate conformance group. And everything else goes in the same one. Okay. And they're not called CPU was before, they're called something more intelligent that we make up. Okay. 
uh, suggestions welcome off offline. But um, but uh, and so then you have the set of those, um, and then Alexi asked or said a, asked a question or, or at least implied a question that I wanted to respond to, which is if that's all you did, and then over time we start having a very large number of conformance groups, right? So you say the following offload compared supports this subset of the confer of you know, 15 conformance groups, and it supports this 13 of them. Okay, and so. Uh, one of the reasons that I like having some higher level concept, right? Christoph phrased it as another level of stuff. I phrase it as just another label that includes uh, and excludes. The reason I like doing that is it uh, makes implementation a lot easier if you're going to say, well, these are going to map to things like, you know, command line options or things in a, um, in a YAML file or whatever that are labels to say, I want to tell my compiler to use the following groups and not use the other groups. How do I do that, right? If I can do it with two or three, instead of having to type in or have my file have 13 of them, that's better. With something that means like CPU equals V4 that includes the following groups, if there's common sets of things, then having a label for that just makes it easier for people to type and use in practice. It doesn't, like, there's nothing you can do that you can't do by having 13 of them, it's just easier. So it's pure preference. So that was my answer. But otherwise, uh, I think I agree with what uh, Christoph and David and others were saying, let's pick different labels, pick things that are logical units and only create them now where we know of cases where it makes sense to not support them, okay? And everything else that we don't know of a case to not support just goes in the base conformance group. That, that's where I'm uh, taking away as, as what I've heard, so. And just to clarify one thing, David, right? Uh, the way to do that would be to use an exclude as well, right? In addition, like if um, Christoph knows something is not supported, maybe they can do an exclude group for that. The reason for that I put in excludes originally was to do with deprecation. But what I've heard here is there's another case that would actually motivate using that excludes column that says, um, if I say, I want to support all the following, you know, ALU instructions, except for that one, because of a reason we can't think of right now, I could define a new group that says all of those, but then add this other label to just that one, and it defines a more convenient way to INA registry it without, it's, it's the same thing as adding another label to all, you know, all but one of them, but it's a little bit easier to say add one label and add uh, a, an exclude throw in there. So it's a little bit easier on the ANA registration, but I believe that this is, I said this last meeting and I was wrong. This, both things are equivalent, right? So. Thanks. Yaron, I think you're in the room. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Because this, this is the end of mine, so. Yaron Schiff, uh, I'm a tourist here, so please uh, take my uh, words with this in mind. Uh, to Two points coming from the uh, CPU uh, world, like physical hardware CPUs. One is uh, CPU ID has worked for the x86 uh, ecosystem for 30 years. The x86 ecosystem is complex, multiple uh, vendors and so on. Maybe there's something to be learned from them. And my second comment is, um, about strictness. Uh, so if I support this and this and this compliance groups, what is the expectation if I, as an interpreter, uh, receive an unsupported instruction? I would say this is all about security and you, sh you must issue an exception. Uh, but um, sort of hearing deprecation, and it's, it's not quite clear from the discussion here what is our stance about that. Thank you. Um, but there are a couple of straightforward answers, but I don't want to take up Alexi's time. I'm out of time here, and I want to make sure we have time to see Alexi's cool slides. And so I want to see all the rest of the time to Alexi. So uh, thanks, everyone. The last question is uh, another co-editor gratefully accepted. So go ahead. Christoph, did you have a first Yeah, I just wanted to throw in, and we don't have to discuss this to the end. I'm very skeptical of the excludes concept because it's just a way that, that, that like skyrockets the amount of complexity, and we can think about a bit more of this offline. Thank you. Alexi. Understand, but what I need, uh, yeah. um, go on your meta code request uh, permission and you get permission. 
go on to me, Tickle. You also enjoy it, yeah. Yeah, well, we used to have a free shot. Son of the mountain. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, first, I'm presenting at the ATF, so, and especially I'm presenting not my slides, I'm presenting, but most of the work and the slides were done by Paul McKinney, who uh, have been doing the memory model work, so uh, I'm a messenger. Agenda, so I have plenty of slides, uh, so feel free to uh, ask questions as they go. It's more informational with, uh, and hopefully a good discussion starter for many of the things. Like in the first, I will try to disambiguate <laughs> the language and abbreviations that people often use on the mailing list, uh, because I think some of the disconnects happen because not people using the same names, but they actually mean different things to different people. So I will start with uh, PS ABI, which is processor specific ABI. And for all, CP so it's, uh, it's defined for all CPUs, like x86 and ARM and RISC, et cetera. And in particular, it is defined for BPF. So BPF is this virtual CPU in that sense. So all of these uh, ABIs, PS ABIs, they include in the first place is a calling convention, uh, how, uh, how arguments are being passed from one function to another. The second biggest is uh, type convention, meaning what is, what is the size of like uh, pointer on this particular CPU and architecture. Then they define L format, but not the L formats that uh, Dave Taylor uh, cares about. It's a different L. It's, uh, what relocations exist in ELF and um, other things like this. Then people often confuse code model and other space definition in the instruction set with actual memory model. So here I want to make it clear that PSABIs and memory model are two uh, different things. And sometimes like for example, in the RISC-V PSABI, they confuse people probably even more that they are talking about atomics and how atomics uh, map to the architecture, which kind of supposed to be covered by the memory model documentation, but it's like 5% of it somehow appeared in the uh, RISC-V PSABI. So what the PSABI is actually even there for? For all uh, architectures except BPF, essentially it's a manual for the compilers. It's a what how when the compiler sees a C code, how they're supposed to generate assembly out of it. Like what decisions they need to make when they see like a pointer void star. What is the size of it? When they see like a long, like what's the size of the long on this particular architecture? Long actually can be different between like Windows and Linux, but it's part of this PS ABI that's that define uh, this kind of stuff. So the main takeaway from here is without PSABI, PSABI, compilers cannot do their job. So it's, and at the same time, the existence of the compiler for a CPU means that there is a PSABI. What it means for a BPF instruction set, for BPF it actually means two things, and we are in unique position unlike all other architectures. For BPF, 
It's a manual for the compiler to translate from C, C++, Rust into BPF instruction set. And at the same time, it's a manual for JITs that take the BPF instruction and then translate it to native. So what JITs do, they have to just do this uh, uh, complicated exercise of blending multiple PSABIs. Let's say we're looking at x86 JIT. x86 JIT knows how x86 PSABI looks and it needs to understand BPF PSABI and map the BPF instruction set into x86 in a way that both, uh, that is still uh, compliant and still following two different PSABIs. So that's actually like when people look at what was the challenge, ask what was the challenge of like creating BPF instruction set is not the instruction set itself. Like picking the bits in the in a registry, whether add is gonna be one or two is an easy part defining BPF PSABI in a way that it's mappable to different uh, our native architectures is the biggest challenge that uh, BPF instructions would solve. So uh, BPF PSABI exists. Unfortunately today, it's a big book full of blank pages. And I would say 80% of those pages uh, have text on them but it's invisible text. Like it's not something that we can even change. Like the text is not yet written, but there is no like ambiguity of what it's gonna be. And this is because compilers today, like both LLVM and GCC generate the code. They, they already made the decision how the calling convention is gonna look like, uh, types, the size of the pointers, et cetera, et cetera, how stack is being managed, what's the stack unwinding. It's, uh, but this 20% is undefined yet. For the example of undefinedness would be floating point. There is no floating point registers or operations in ISA, but in any other CPU, they are part of PSABI as well, like how you even like pass floating points from one function to another. Or another example would be thread local storage. Thread local storage not necessarily makes sense for something like BPF, but compilers have to do something when they see underscore underscore thread in your variable. So they have to map to TLS and this is like the exact, uh, in the category of what PSABI defines. So this is 20% that we would need to define um, for like PSABI to be complete. Now uh, to the memory model. So as I said, it's completely, it's a different uh, big document. And PSABI is about single, single CPU. It's how to translate higher level language like a C, C++ into assembly without thinking about concurrency issues. Memory model addresses the second part of this problem is explaining to the compilers and to the users what to do with the concurrent, ac concurrent access when multiple CPUs, let's say running different BPF programs or when one CPU is running BPF in a kernel and another one in user space or when it is a program in a kernel and another CPU, the actual like real kernel code that potentially following a different memory model. So in the past, our answer to, to this problem was just use Linux kernel memory model. And it's a difference and a unique advantage of a language memory models like C that it's a, any language model, model is a strict subset of Linux kernel. So we take C for the kernel programming and then add extra restrictions that the programmers have to follow to be conformant for the, for the code to make sense, for the compiler not to mess it up. So that's uh, what I just described, the uh, high language memory models being used by the compiler to demonstrate the instruction set, and then JITs take the instructions and map it to x86. They do it partially with this uh, PSABI that's defined for both in this, like, in this invisible book and due to the memory model. So that's where, um, what we're defining today is this new instruction level as we call it in like BPF memory model. So this, I would say the most important slide of this presentation and understanding why defining BPF PSABI and BPF memory model is so unique and challenging in the industry because we're not solving what CPUs typically do. We're not, uh, we're addressing two parts of this like equation for, that goes from the top, from the higher language into instruction set and from the instruction set into, into the hardware. And when this translation translation happens 
uh, let's say on x86, JITs just map all of the BPF instructions to, to x86 one to one. But on things like uh, hardware float, like uh, smart NICs, it's actually a completely different process. There can be multiple step, steps and optimizers that are in between the instructions into the um, into different architecture, which creates these unique challenges, especially for the memory model. Um, a bit aside of why like Linux kernel mod memory model exists in the first place. Uh, compilers, they don't understand control dependencies and will happily break them. So we'll give an example later of, of this, why uh, this memory barriers document exists and why Linux kernel memory model was developed in the first place. And the second part is this OOTA. OOTA stands for out of thin air. And this is inherent problem of uh, higher level languages like C. What it means that uh, just by, if we follow the generality and description of C memory model as, as it is defined, like for this particular case, if uh, you have like two variables, X and Y, and um, they have like initial value, value of zero initially. And this code on the left and the right executes executed on uh, two different CPUs at the same time. So what C memory model allows, that value returned by X and Y can be 42. Like effectively like any value is okay with the model. And this is, that's how it is. So people have been trying to solve it. Uh, and of course, this is, only in theory, right? So like in practice, like CPUs or any hardware will never like give you just a random number, like it, <laughs> uh, especially when there was zeros, zeros in there, but memory, language memory model cannot deal with it. There were attempts in the past uh, and still ongoing to address it, but uh, it's impossible within the constraints of how it is defined and the compiler people when look at it, either it's uh, compilers will become uh, super restrictive and generate horrible code, or we have to leave uh, memory model assist. So that's why this problem is, uh, my claim is it is unsolvable. That's why for the, for the BPF memory model, we're using this more lower level instruction CPU like memory model. So, uh, for BPF, it also exists similar to PSABI. It's uh, another completely different big book full of blank pages. Uh, in this case, we're working like Paul McKinney and others are working on discovering it and defining the pieces of it that is uh, corner cases and uh, black, black magic and defining the things that don't exist yet. But 80% of it is there, it needs to be, it needs to be documented. And LVM and JITs and what the JITs do is now is effectively source or source of truth for all of this. Um, to explain what this work actually is doing. And we just, in the previous uh, day's talk, we just talked about grouping. So here I will group instructions in these three categories for the purpose of understanding of uh, memory model. Is one is whole set of atomics, then uh, all conditional jump instructions, which uh, like not not special in any way, and uh, load 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 and store instructions. I will start with atomics. So we have uh, exchange and compare exchange and atomic at or whether with fetch modifier or not. The way it is defined today and not necessarily all JITs are compliant with this, is compare exchange and compare exchange are fully ordered. This is how it's written in this uh, um, blank page memory model book. The way of thinking about it is for uh, it, that it's a memory barrier for like using Linux terminology, SMP memory, memory barrier followed by atomic compare exchange relaxed. Uh, followed in other uh, SMP memory barriers. And I'm not sure that today, even all JITs inside the Linux kernel, they map uh, uh, these two instructions correctly because some of, because only CPU uh, 
architecture maintainers for a particular architecture know exactly how it's implemented in the hardware. And when we review the code, when people send us, let's say, like S390 JIT support for BPF, we're like, yeah, that makes sense. You're the expert. You're generating the bits. Do the instructions map exactly? And does it follow this like fully ordered behavior? Maybe. We trust you. We think we know what, what, what you're doing. Uh, another set of instructions is atomic uh, add and or. So those are not, uh, those are completely unordered and we follow um, the standard of the Linux kernel in that sense, the atomic add operation is unordered, but when it is implemented by x86 JITs, it's actually fully, fully ordered because on x86, log x add is a fully ordered atomic operation. So JITs in this case, x86 JIT, choose to implement stronger ordering guarantees than BPF memory model requires, and, and it is okay. Uh, the, those with the fetch are fully ordered, so I can skip this. This is all details. So now I'm uh, going to the second category of the instruction. Those are conditional, conditional instructions. And um, So the way BPF memory model defines it is they provide weak ordering. And what it means, what I mean by that can be explained by the uh, next slide. So if we have, let's say, a load instruction that follow it, follow it by the conditional and there is a store instructions, what we require JITs to do is to uh, preserve the ordering because the conditional, conditional instructions provide this guarantee that the load has to execute and the value of it known for the conditional operand before before store. So this is this is how like compiler translated, and in this case, this is C code on the left. Read once is a volatile read of uh, variable X, and on the right is a BPF assembly that both GCC and LVM uh, generate today. And this is just an example. And this is the example of the dependency breakage that compilers do. So in this case, you notice that both sides of the um, branches, they write the same value and compilers, all compilers, are smart enough to optimize it uh, into just like read and write. And what, what just happened here, like if you uh, naive, uh, or not necessarily naive, but they just let like the person who didn't read really Linux kernel memory model document and write in a kernel code or BPF code, and this is the code that you wrote on the, on the left side. You, as you may be assuming that there is a control dependency because you're reading, because the if can only like proceed after checking the value of zero and the write will execute after read. But due to, due to compiler optimization, there will be no conditional there at all. There will be only read and write. And on x86, it's not a problem. Like it's strong, it's uh, so, total store order because of uh, x86, read will execute before the write, but on weakly ordered architectures like ARM and others, read and write can actually go out of order and that might cause all sorts of problems for BPF programs and, C and kernel code that's not written with, uh, with a full understanding of what control dependency are and how compilers can break them. For BPF, it's even more challenging because we have JITs and Currently, some of the JITs, so there is actually one JIT that's super smart. It's taking BPF assembly, converting it into LVMIR, optimizing it, and generating new code. So effectively, we have two compilers, one compiling from C to assembly, and the second one, JITs, uh, from assembly into x86. And they definitely do the optimization like this. But in this case, when they do this, what we are saying that they will not be conforming with BPF memory model. So they should not be doing this, this, this kind of stuff. Yeah, I've talked about this part. Uh, I guess we can skip this. So yeah, another, another interesting example of optimization. Um, so here, you would think that the uh, code on the left, the way it's written in C, both writes will execute after the first after the first load, and without compiler optimization, that would be the case. 
and on x86, so the code on the right is x86 code. It's it's also the same way because of the conditional move followed followed by stores. Uh, Intel will execute in in sequence, but on ARM, conditional move is its own is its own operation. So the store the control flow converged at the conditional move instruction. So the store uh, into variable z after doesn't have a, a control dependency constraint here. So, and that is also something that you, well, unless you really know what is, what is happening and follow uh, Linux kernel memory model and VPF memory model faithfully, this is, this is type of the issues that, that can happen. And JITs have to be like careful not to do this, this type of stuff. Uh, now, my third and last uh, category of uh, assembly, BPF assembly instruction is load and store instructions. And here I'm explaining the uh, data dependency between loads. So like the load instruction, whether then it's providing either address or the value for the subsequent load or for the store to store in some memory, there is a dependency chain, the data dependency chain and CPUs uh, track it, track it faithfully. Uh, on x86, it's uh, obviously a total stall order. On ARM, the address and data dependency between load and another load, the load and store without any if conditions are tracked, tracked by the hardware. But this is not the case on like potentially some other like crazy architectures that should be like very carefully when they uh, translate BPF instructions into the native. Yeah, I can skip this. So uh, back to back to my initial point. So BPF memory model is defining what the compiler is supposed to do, what compilers must do for the code to make sense, for the you for don't shoot the the so the, and for the JITs to uh, follow it. So what JITs can do if they don't really care about performance. They can just put the fence operation everywhere. Obviously, that will degrade performance greatly, but it will be in conformance with BPF memory model. They can do a halfway. They can convert every load store instruction that is defined today by the say into load load acquire store release. But that's again on x86 that makes. Uh, no difference, performance will be the same, but on ARM, load acquire is more expensive than the regular load. So what we are saying uh, is the third option here, rely on source level, the, C's, uh, the C code of VPF program to have been that this program followed Linux kernel memory model uh, standards. Then JITs can map like load stores into just a regular load stores on, on, particular, on particular architectures. Um, as I said, like BPF memory model is not written anywhere. Uh, it's blank page book, and we can discover it by looking at what uh, compilers do with uh, built-in built -in atomics. I will skip this. For example, on GCC, there is a full uh, memory barrier, uh, this atomic thread fence. Currently, neither compiler nor GCC nor LVM implemented, but Thankfully, we have this atomic uh, store instruction, so with value zero, and on x86, it's actually exactly what uh, Linux kernel is using to implement SMP, SMP memory barrier. So for the rest of the Docker, this uh, slides we just call like BPF memory barrier. So this is one, potentially will be one of our future instructions that will add to ASA, because compilers can potentially compile this atomic thread fence into this um, lock, uh, lock and add instruction that already exists in BPF ASA. And it will behave like a proper memory barrier on x86, but that's not, uh, well, nice to uh, other architectures. Having said that, uh, Christoph's point earlier was, well, there is no use for any atomics. Maybe there is no use for atomics, but then it would mean there is no use for any barriers either in this particular. So whether we group all future barrier instructions into atomics or atomics and the barrier will be separate grouping is something to, that we will bike shed, I guess, on the list. Uh, 
um, two flavors of atomic load. Uh, again, neither GCC nor LVM support this yet. For relaxed ordering, they affected all normal loads, load and LDX instructions, and non-relaxed potentially can be implemented by LVM with an extra memory barrier once it's, once it's there. Uh, similar for stores, uh, compare exchange already already working as design and exchange and compare exchange. So in case of uh, <coughs> regular atomic operations like atomic or what we don't have, that's again another consideration for the future MCPU V5 uh, architecture, whether we will have atomic tension NAND. This is something that doesn't exist in ISA and compiler cannot, well, cannot really generate anything for it because, well, cannot. <laughs> Similar here. Um, those are not supported yet. And then defenses again. And my last topic is the helper ordering. As I said, uh, the programs can be running on a different CPU. So imagine on one CPU, you have a VPF program that is following uh, BPF PS ABI following BPF memory model, all the code is written with uh, conforming to them, and it goes through this process of compiling, then assembly instruction, the JITs do everything that they're supposed to do. Everything is nice, so this is one CPU. On another CPU, you have just a, a, what we call a BPF helper, which is written as a C code inside the kernel. It's also following Linux kernel memory model. It's compiled by GCC, but then our Clang into native. So what is what are the ordering guarantees when these two CPUs following like different memory model? Should they be like ordered or not? So our proposal so far that no ordering is defined uh, unless this particular helper on the kernel side needs to, unless it's like a requirement for this particular helper. So that's. Uh, that's part of VPF memory model that goes into this 20% of undefined stuff that we're, we're defining as we go. And two new instructions. So we just talked about grouping two new, two new instructions that we're thinking to, well, at least two, uh, is load, acquire, and store release. On x86, uh, there will be like true new instructions, new upcodes in ISA. On x86, they will map to normal load store, but on ARM, they actually will be different. It's instead of load, it will be load acquire and similar, similar to the store. Um, what we did in the past with the MCPU v4, we waited almost two years to collect all of the ideas and uh, feature requests uh, from different like companies. And we grouped them together and said, now this is MCPU v4 and added them all at once to compiler, to JITs and to the verifier, though they came from very different like categories. Like MCPU before, it includes uh, signed, uh, sign, um, sign extending loads, sign extending move operations. It includes uh, 32 bit jump, which is yeah completely different, and includes all kinds of different byte swaps. So if they were grouped, it will be at least like four different uh, groups that would go into single MCPU v4, but we did them all at once just to, well, make it easier for the compilers and the users when they're saying, well, I want to use v4, you get everything, everything with it. Similarly, we'll probably do the same thing here for the future MCPU v5. We'll wait until like load acquire fully like implemented with that at its use in compiler, in the verifier, in the kernel, that it's actually like benefits and a similar, and at the same time, we'll probably add the barriers because uh, we already like have requests by the community to add this kind of instructions. That's pretty much all what I wanted to say. And here is like all the additional information about if you want to follow. Questions? Thanks, Alexi. Uh, Dave, did you have any comments on that? David? David? Go ahead, David. 
Oh, sorry, I'm 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 all right. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to say I mean it's it seems pretty clear that a language memory model is completely out of the question, right? It's like if you look in industry, there's all these problems with with um, out of thin air. People have been making proposals to to fix it, um, but then it suffered. ARM doesn't like that, so it could potentially hurt performance on ARM. And so I think, uh, yeah, in general, using using something like Linux kernel memory model to impose uh, dependency ordering that you don't get from compilers and you don't you don't get from the language uh, memory model itself feels like the only realistic um, realistic approach. Dave. Okay. Um, so, oh, I think this is a great presentation, Alexi. My question is actually to uh, the chairs and the AD. Um, I think Alexi's presentation makes a good case for why there needs to be a BPF memory model document in order to say, implement a compiler and have stuff work. Um, my question is, uh, does this fall under one of the existing charter items? Uh, like, do, for example, does this kind of squint and fall under, you know, compiler requirements, or uh, could we say it's in a separate document, but it kind of falls under B, uh, under the ABI one? But Alexi explained it's not quite the ABI, but maybe on the charter speak it is, and it's just a separate document or something. And so my question is, um, I think the working group needs to fill in those uh, blank pages that uh, Alexi mentioned. That's my opinion. And if you agree, then how do we go about doing this? I think so too. So, like, the reason we're all here is to exactly work out the details, how we're going to fill in uh, all of these details. Though not everyone in the community like agrees. Some of the compiler folks believe that things like PSABI and memory model has to stay out of the standard. That IETF is not the right forum, effectively, to uh, document them because it's there was no such precedent. Like X86. PSABI is maintained uh, in a GitHub effectively by a group of people and similar to like different different memory models. For memory models, like arguably the C memory model has its own like standard for sure. Uh, while RISC V uh, doesn't like it, they just like define it here. So what my personal preference is actually trying to see whether um, ATF process might be a fit for this because of like openness and, and everything and uh, see how, how it goes. So um, I, I see that certainly fits into one of our um, items in here, which is documents that recommend conventions and guidelines uh, uh, on the charter. That's so the one I would say too. The only problem is that one has an information across it. And as Lexi presented, if it's not proposed standard, you don't get an interoperability. Okay. Um, I think we can look. Well, if you can change that I to a PS, I agree. That, well, but that's the problem with that bullet. I think. I, I think that there, there's two questions. One is whether we should have this being documented in, in IETF, and the second is whether it should be a proposed standard and an informational doc. And I, I would, my personal perspective is that we've already answered the second question. I mean, this is, we're talking about calling conventions, we're talking about um, like all the stuff that Alexi mentioned, that's, I think that stuff we always intended to be putting into that document and the memory model. I mean, it's all sort of part of the same, you know, the same group of things, right? It's like, what would a compilers and JITs have to do, um, to create interoperable binaries? And I, I, I don't think we would want to make that into a proposed standard, but, um, I, that's at least my impression is that that was our original intention was not, it was not here. So unless something so, yeah. changed. Yeah, know just to just to just uh, uh, cross the T's. I'm not proposing to change the charter. Yes, we have we have uh, ABIs and uh, compiler requirements as informational. So I prefer to stay to stay this way because I think this is, uh, yeah, it's something that will be evolving for the long time. So we have uh, a lot of work ahead of us, just writing down what the SABI is in the, in words instead of source code and the same for the for the memory model all of it now is the source code and some people understand it but <clears throat> it's a challenge so it's, it it will be a challenge just converting it to words okay so what i'm hearing is the answer is it's in the charter right now but we need to do it as informational that's what i hear is the answer to my question okay. yes thank you david i'll say additionally that the 
the uh, bulleted list of documents and their and their status is actually prepended with some text that says with intended document status. So we uh, we might have some wiggle room, yeah. Christoph, I think next. Christoph, you want to go ahead? Christoph, unmute. Christoph, I cannot hear you. Still cannot. Is this better now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I switched headsets and it looks like the other one didn't work. Um, so slight disagreement, but maybe that's just because we're talking past each other. So on the memory model, the important thing to remember is basically for if we look at existing like C or whatever language code on, on quote unquote normal processors, there's always two memory models involved. One is the memory model that defines the hardware or in this case like VM behavior and then there is the language memory model that needs to map to the hardware or VM model one way or another. And defining the low level memory model for eBPF, I think we have no option except making it an actual normative spec as part of our spec family. The actual programming model memory model is different and if we do it in ITF at all, yeah, it's probably informational. I don't know, I would, different question. But I, I, I don't think we can have a non-normative or, or non-standardized hardware memory model. Now the PSABI, I think it would be really useful to have it in the same place and I consider it normative, but I mean, if, if there's opposition, and the opposition is actually voiced in this group, which means we need to get the compiler people to actually show up here and express it. I could live with having it non-normative, but I don't think it's actually a good idea. Well, I think the, the compiler people have voiced opposition on the list, right? I think, I think Jose, is, at least Jose has chimed in pretty regularly to, to, uh, to suggest that it should be informational. So you're talking uh, about the memory model or PSAPI? Well, they're they're kind of related, right? That's that's sort of a no. Way. They're not. They're absolutely not. I mean, the PSAPI documents I've seen don't actually talk about the memory model at all. Well, Alexei, do you want to? Yeah. So, like, yeah. so PSAPI and memory model, these are two different documents because like one is addressing what compiler is supposed to do to generate code and memory model talks about concurrency. So they can be one doc that, but that will be weird because uh, well, in industry, this, those are different. Then uh, answering uh, Christoph's question about two memory models. Yes, like that's what I started on the slides and now I'm presenting the slide. So there is language memory models like C, C++ and Linux kernel model, kernel memory model applies there as well. And what we initially did for BPF is just said, well, BPF memory model is, is the same as Linux kernel, mod, Linux kernel memory model, but we are refining it now into, for it to be more uh, CPU-like, because because CPU CPUs, they also, when CPU, let's say RISC-5 or X86, when they define memory model, for them it's a bit more than they also define memory consistency. They, they say like how this instructions like supposed to behave. With BPF memory model, we cannot do this. We cannot say that we are a total store order. Like if we say this, that immediately all of the arms, uh, arm, 
ARM JIT will, will, have, uh, will have a hit, right? So we, that's why I think the common ground here is to have it, uh, BPF memory to be CPU-like, like this lower bar, like x86 on ARM, and at the same time, uh, be high level similar to Linux kernel memory model. That's why it's like challenging. So that's why maybe we're like talking a bit past each other. Uh, since it's, I think like this is actually like new concept that does not exist in industry. And when people just say like memory model, they assume either C or CPU, right? So we yeah. need something brand new here that's sort of in between that I somehow satisfy both. So we have this error compiler from top and JITs in the bottom and memory model has to be the guidance, the instruction manual for both and for the users that will be writing those programs. I mean, so, I, I think I actually mostly agree with you, right? I mean, basically what we need to do is to write something that acts as a hardware quote unquote memory model that is closely based on the Linux memory model. And by the way, if you look at the real CPUs it's very, very common that actual CPU implementations or microarchitectures have a way stronger memory model than the instruction set memory model requires. Say so a lot of RISC-V CPUs actually have a fairly strong memory model that isn't anywhere near as weak as the crazy academically designed everything is possible order in RISC-V. True. I think they designed it that way for on purpose, right? They want to give people the flexibility to, to do so, it. Uh, and also, well, I said in the group, I can tell you some stories, but it's probably not for public. <laughs> also, I want to touch by uh, this conformant versus not, informational versus standard. So even things like the SABI, one might think that it has to be standard, right? It should, like if two compilers just producing whatever, something else, like they're not following the BPF calling convention, then it's completely useless, right? So like why you would even have a compiler that's not following uh, BPF PS ABI? Well, turned out that this is actually is useful in practice for like on, on x86, like the way kernel compiles for 32-bit, it's not following 32-bit x86 PS ABI. Uh, the kernel is compiled with extra GC flag that says like use these three extra registers and it's immediately like, well, not conformant, right? So this is the example where practical considerations trump uh, the purity of like conformance. And I suspect like we should be mindful of, I think we should be mindful of that with uh, BPF PS ABI. I think it should be informational, but I can see compilers like having this extra flags to do things that are non-conforming. In another example on ARM, uh, on ARM GCC has a flag that says like W, it's, I think it's even called like W PS ABI and W no dash PS ABI where it allows compiler not to conform to ARM memory model, which also think feels like unnatural and pointless, but here we go. Um, I think uh, just because there's cases where people might have an option to not be compliant by itself isn't a reason to not be proposed standard. Uh, I think uh, at, Eric and I and probably some other people can think of cases where uh, in, say, IPv6, uh, some implementations chose to be non-compliant to, say, source address selection, or to have a mode to put you in a non-compliant thing to have alternate behavior. There is a proposed standard, so you can either configure yourself to be compliant to that or to something else, right? But it's still a proposed standard. And I think that same argument would apply here that says, um, I think there's a good argument for why things like PSABI should be uh, proposed standard, even if you want to have an option that says, and I'm not compliant to the standard, I'm compliant to some other specification, that's okay. That's my opinion. So. Arguable, right? So, you know, uh, Jose's, uh, Jose's opinion, I think he's not uh, on call here, but he strongly believes that IDPS ABI or memory model, they should not be a standard. They should be like information or just passing the message. It can certainly start as informational. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's interesting is if we can get him to say why, right? 
uh, what's the technical argument or whatever? Because maybe I'll agree with them. I don't know. I'm just saying that just because somebody does it, I don't think is a good reason to not be proposed standard because I think there's cases in, in IPv6 where we already have that and it's proposed standard. So. Um, so, Alexi, can you come up with a draft sometime soon? Sorry, what? A draft? Oh, draft, yeah. So, well, exactly, yeah. So, that's what uh, Paul is working on. As I said, I'm the messenger, uh, Paul doing most of the work. Uh, and the plan is exactly to get an agreement like here. Uh, in it's through, and we of course like not going to be only at ATF. Uh, we are working with uh, different compiler like both the GCC and LVM communities and kernel community of course as well. So uh, Paul will, will be presenting his work at Linux Plumbers uh, next week uh, regarding the VPF memory model. Once we converge for this first set for the first like 80%, that's more or less like non-negotiable like of course like we can make changes to some of some of this invisible words though they better be this way like we cannot change really now that's like the things like calling convention uh for for the for the vpf or to say that compare exchange is not going to be fully ordered that's not like it's it's part of the linux journal api uh, at this point so it's not something we can change without uh so some of the stuff are not 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 for change. They just need to be documented, and some other stuff uh, there is a uh, room to define it that it's uh, more uh, long term, uh, better better pass long term. So that's what we're trying to get from uh, from this room presenting here, then from Linux plumbers and from the mailing list. And once it's there, uh, there will be a document document produced in what form. Yeah, we'll see. So, and the timeline is also like not not clear. Okay. But that's definitely like on to do list. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I don't see anybody in the queue, so thank you very much, and um, we can have an early lunch today. And thanks for making this an awesome meeting. Thank you. See you in Brisbane. And uh, best wishes, uh, David, for your awesome wedding. Send photos. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I will. Bye, everyone. Thank you.